It's the Luna Show. 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 watching the Luna show and right now you're about to meet the legendary Michael Dupree. So right now we are with the legendary Michael Dupree. Will you be considered iconic too? Um I think iconic is what you do with your life. Mm -hmm. So much as the ballroom scene, um, there are some people who take labels to the extreme. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to be considered Michael Dupree and just be acknowledged for who I am. Mm -hmm. But iconic, um, <laughs> I don't know if I have enough time to be, in, <laughs> be considered iconic, even though I was around. In the iconic years. Yeah, yes. Pretty um, much everybody from your era, it's basically. Iconic, I believe so. But they, I think they have more of an impact on the ballroom scene than I actually done. Mm -hmm. um, I believe most of the mothers, the founding houses were from my generation, which I believe are iconic. And so to be part of those houses, I guess I feel I'm mm -hmm. privileged to be iconic, to be still a member alive here today, right. being iconic. So. so tell me what started you in the uh, ballroom scene? Like, how did it start for you? Well, actually, I used to go to this club called Boys Town. It was in the mm, sounds fun. area. Yes, it was a <laughs> Sunday night party. It was like I was fresh out of high school. I think I had like six months left, actually. Mm. And so I used to go every Sunday. You know, I'm coming out. I'm just finding my sexuality, and I'm, you know, and I'm finding places to go. And I've actually went to this one particular place called Boys Town, and this one particular Sunday there was a. Uh, an event. I wasn't even aware what it was, but um, as a normal Sunday patron, I was always going. Mm -hmm. And that was um, a ball given by R. R. Chanel. In the space? In this space. In Boyd's <laughs> Town. I must give it to him. This was like 1982. Okay. 80, 81, 82. Also, balls were already happening in downtown by that time. Uh, actually, um, it was very rare. Um, I, well, I wasn't participating at that time, so but they were going from different states mm -hmm. back and forth. Even downtown, there were some like the Bonneville Bear Room, mm -hmm. Bonnie Bailey Ballroom, where these <laughs> girls were just competing. Oh, really? And so, yeah, there were very few that were going on downtown. Mm -hmm. And so, it happened that I went to my normal club Sunday night, get my little party on, and there was this event that was going on. There was like people just gathering around. It wasn't like it was a normal party, so something was in the air, and I was like, what's going on? And then, you know, people <laughs> were saying, well, it's like a ball, and I said, what's a ball? Mm -hmm. I had no clue, really. And this is the first night I ever seen Paris Degree walk. Oh, okay. And she walked for a futuristic category, and I, I'm watching what she was doing, I was like, I was more entertained than I normally would have been just going to the <laughs> You know, looking at the man. I could imagine. Around. Yeah. So she was no, especially with out, Paris. Oh, she was peeling out of this. Coming, she came out of a spaceship that was all glittered up, and I'm like, "What is going on?" And so mm -hmm. they were having this category. She, she actually blew my mind. I've never seen anybody do this type of production right. in my lifetime, and it was very interesting to see her do. They had other categories like punk rock, you know, and I was like, "Well." Why this is what is this? Is it a fashion show? And Do you think what's the point? I I didn't think past it until I started giving out these trophies, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, by me being a regular at this particular little, little space, mm -hmm. they happened to call this category called face, and I I kind of knew I was kind of cute back then, mm -hmm. and so I was young, you know, oblivious to what this whole formation was. I just got out there, did my normal little strut. Like when I felt like I was in my, you know, my heydays. Mm -hmm. 
And David, David <laughs> Ultra Extravaganza, but at that time he was a Christian, or was he a Dior? David, he wasn't in the house. There wasn't an extravaganza, but it was David Ultra mm -hmm. who walked in. And he, I, first time I ever saw him, and I found him to be striking, and he was very attractive for a manly man, cause, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a little kid compared to what they were looking like at that mm -hmm. time. And it kind of got me intrigued. And one of my friends, who was a normal ball walker, but I didn't know what he was doing at this time, named Brian LaBeja, God bless the dead, had brought me over to meet Paris. He was also going to Boys Town on the regular Sunday night parties, too. And introduced me to Paris and William, and I was just taken back. I, I didn't know what to say. I was just like, well, wow, is this a, is she the entertainer, star, so. So right. take it back. So I think that really got me interested. So I started talking with them, and then next thing I know, they started coming down to Peter Rabbit's. Yeah. Next thing I know, they was like, <laughs> well, we need you to come uptown to Harlem. I was like, Harlem? Ooh, who goes up in Harlem? I'm mm. from Brooklyn. So, you know, I was like, no, ma'am. Uh -huh. But um, they made me a little bit more interested in what was going on. Mm -hmm. So they brought me along up to Harlem. And, and you've been with Dupree there. since? Always, never found a need to walk. I mean, I've seen other extravagant houses, like the Labages were back then, the Pendavises. Oh my God, these were, they were doing major, major entertaining mm -hmm. productions and stuff that it was just beyond anything. But I just I just was drawn to the House of Dupree because once I met the rest of the members mm -hmm. and I saw what they were giving and I, I met Tony Reed, Tony Tenille Dupree mm -hmm. and I saw William and I saw Jerry Dupree and I saw all the other guys that were walking in the house and I was never felt the need to be another house mm -hmm. because I, I thought we were well rounded and overall top of the houses okay I mean <laughs> back then there was like a level of competition that you will always hear the name of Dupree screamed about mm -hmm. and make no mistake Pete Avis reigned for the house of Pendavis there were very few in our house during my time that you were here oh Pendavis that person it was La Beja there was like the, the drag queens not so much younger than young butch queens at that time that were just coming in but they were still not during my generation, I think I came in right in the middle mm -hmm. of the younger generation that was coming into the Harlem Ballroom scene. And I think I was like maybe one of the babies of the House of Dupree's before I brought my children in. So, mm -hmm. so well, how was Paris Dupree she, as a person? She was very strict. <laughs> and she didn't take a lot of crap. You know, she didn't want me as a being younger than the rest of the house members to be lax. She was like, she knew I was in school. Mm -hmm. She knew I was, you know, she was kind of more of a really, really, um, she was more like a chaperone to me because she wouldn't let me get involved with some of the things that the other older members in the house were getting involved with, like drugs. And she kind of steered me away and she kind of kept me under her wing. Mm -hmm. Like, well, okay, you could come here and stay for a few minutes. But you got to do something. You can't just be out there stealing and running the streets, the clubs. Mm -hmm. You could finish your school. And when she saw I was getting a little too lax uptown, it was, I actually was staying uptown in their home with Paris and William. We were living on 110 on West 11th Street. And she saw I was getting really comfortable. I was staying more than just one night. And, you know, I was <laughs> staying three or four in a consecutive. She's like, babe, you got to go home. You know, you can't stay here and not do anything as opposed to me being in my mother's house and not doing anything. She already said you couldn't stay here and not do nothing. You don't want to go to school. You don't want to work. You got to find something to do. But Paris really kept that foundation in me. She kind of really pushed me to continue on to do something much, much better mm -hmm. for myself. And that I will never forget. Right. Well, that's that's what's so different about the mothers back then. They were a little bit more. Yes. And Avis, we used to go over Avis' house and <laughs> have a key key. I would sit there. She I used to love going to her house. Oh my God, she was a mother. She loved she her Kool Aid. Mother, right? <laughs> yeah. 
She was another second mother to me. Me and that phone, she was like, baby, y'all got to do something. What are y'all doing? Are y'all working? Are y'all mm-hmm. in school? What are you doing? You know? She was very that. Oh my yeah. God. And so I respect that. Those mothers back then, I think they really took that initiative or that, that title in a better, better sense as far as, okay, we're much younger than their generation, but they saw potential and they did push for us to do better. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing I'm going to miss about the actual iconic mothers of the house. Right. Yeah, I'm sure there are some younger mothers nowadays who can start that in their children and want to see them do better. And but I, I know them from my own experience, and I can't, I can't, I can't. There's no comparison for me. So. Mm-hmm. so that's a good segue into what do you think about the comparison between the balls yesterday and today? Um. I think nowadays, it's most of the categories that were really creative categories where you have to be talented and really know how to put it together, uh-huh. it's long gone. It's a ready-made ballroom theme now. I mean, I'm, I have no problem about analyzing like labels and stuff like that, but I believe if the designer already has a runway show once a year, once you know, three times for seasons, for you to bring the repetitive stuff that's already been brought to a runway, not saying that it shouldn't be done, but the creativeness that was there then, mm-hmm. you had to really be creative. There was an art form that seems to be lacking nowadays i don't take any way anything away. well a lot of kids are not a soul i don't know how to sew. <laughs> see that's, that's something that was lost <laughs> i used to have to sit there with paris to help her bead these gowns uh-huh. glue these feathers for back pieces we didn't just sit there and <laughs> tell her to walk paris right. we had to help put her together well see avis didn't want us to touch anything <laughs> well you know she's a perfectionist because if she had to she do it want no again, help. And, and make no mistake she was a, but she was an extremely talented seamstress yeah. I mean, Definitely. she. I know she used to do work for people from Vegas. She used to come here for for gowns and little mm-hmm. beads and pieces and stuff just for her creativity. Her and Dorian Corey were known world statewide, statewide across mm-hmm. the states for their gowns and stuff and their work. And Avis was one of the top top you know. Do Do you think that um, if that it's a missed opportunity that they were so talented at what they did, like Dorian was great, uh, Avis, in, in terms of their designs. Do you think that they could have maybe been, you know, fashion designers of sort? Because they were in so, our scene. Right. But they are. I mean, they were very underground. They did not go to the mainstream, mm-hmm. um, you know, fashion world as far as their stuff, but their, their creativity, their art form. I think they were above, 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 above mm-hmm. par when it comes to that work. And it's a shame. If, so nowadays, I think if they had initially set these girls down, set us down, and said, listen, this is how you stitch so one, par two, you would be able to be a top-notch designer. Mm-hmm. I knew pa- um, Avis actually made Kim learn how to really stitch it right. Kemp and Davis, God bless the dead. Right. Now, for this young queen, she was right a long <laughs> time, fine, but her workmanship for her age and her talent was beyond. But that took someone to actually tutor them and to train them how to do it. Uh-huh. So I think if they were still alive, they could have possibly had their own fashion schools, you know, some, you know something to think about. Yeah. Something like that. Some art forms that need to be passed on, like, from one generation to generation, sometimes we miss the mark and then we lose uh-huh. it. You know, some things you can't actually carry on into, you know, uh-huh. another generation. Some some just don't want to learn, right. you know. <laughs> but believe me, but I believe there are some talented people who still probably know how to sell. Uh-huh. That's why they go to a fashion world in the industry. So so it's the creativity then between the yesterday ballroom and. And today, Bo. Do you think that some kids today are creative? Or it's just a different aspect of it, though, right? I, I think it's um, a more stylish, not so much creativity. You know how to put it together. You could put it together. Mm-hmm. You could take um, a you know a hat, shirt, pants, and it really looks exceptional. 
Right. You know, you can put these shoes together. You may probably put a headpiece on, like a mask, to look creative. I think it's more considered a stylist type right. of point of view. The creativity of creating your own from the from the scratch. I think that may be lacking. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of um, like your category, what was it like back in your time? Hard. <laughs> I mean, um, I came like because all the greats were back then. I mean, but they. Were, how do you manage? <laughs> when I initially came out, I think I think my hardest part was because I still look like a little kid. Mm -hmm. I could look like I could have get in. Face was always your category, though, right? Face was okay. my, primarily my categories until I had to start branching out. Mm -hmm. like, well, there are other things you can walk besides face. Mm -hmm. and so, but in my category, when I first came along, I think I would look at two two effeminate to be actually considered a masculine face. They didn't have the the different categories of face until later on, like dark and lovely versus like there was mm -hmm. no pretty boy at that time. It was just face. Okay. So you know, and there was masculine mature men who were like five and seven years older than I who had that mature look already at that time. So it was a hard for me to get through there until I had finally started shaving little hairs until it got <laughs> thicker and kept the mustache on, painting it on, you know, just to give it a look of masculine uh -huh. look. But I was still, I would still look like I can get in drag for any second. Mm -hmm. I Did you ever dabble in drag? No. <laughs> I wanted to so bad. I actually tried to. One time I was going to do the comedy show in Peter Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I, was going to, I was going to do Bad Company uh -huh. to call us, and unfortunately I missed the show when I got there too late. Uh -huh. Trying to put it together. I had the whole get up. <laughs> I never walked first time in drag. They thought I was ready when the first time they ever had that category was at one of Peppers and Functions. And I was coming to walk in and chicken down. And I, said, <laughs> I came for four green projects, so I thought uh -huh. it was like kind of hard coming through projects in them. I'm not saying that wouldn't have been easier, but I had kind of like four older brothers that mm -hmm. probably wouldn't want to see me go that far. Right. But, you know, opportunity missed, but I'm, com I'm comfortable where I'm at now. All right. <laughs> so in terms of the scene, who do you miss that isn't here anymore? Oh, God. I miss I mean, I'm just, mm -hmm. I miss Paris. I just, I really miss Paris. I miss William. A lot of my house members and Kashmir, she was my best friend, Kashmir Dupree Ebony, blah blah blah. <laughs> she was like my best BF best and she was the one who really taught me a lot about fashion things, like couture labels and stuff. Right. She was a she was a label diva from the con from the get up. A lot of those guys, a lot of the mature guys that were there, like the whole House of Princess had a whole set of hot boys from uptown. They were hot looking men that, <laughs> you know, I'm being a younger guy looking at a you know, a couple of guys older than me, I miss a lot of those guys. You know, even some of the younger people that uh, went on past them, like Chrissy Dupree, Kenny, the whole look Ephraim's daughters, uh -huh. her kids, a lot of them went away too soon. And I miss seeing them. I wonder what they would have been, their life would have been like, you know, like now. Right. They were still with us. I know that um, the ballroom scene was one of the hardest hit um, in terms of AIDS and, yes. you know, and also through the 80s with uh, crack era and all of that and drugs. And so mm -hmm. how do you personally deal with all of that that was happening? Because although balls are glamorous and fun, mm -hmm. there was also a deep seriousness with all of those issues. Yes. Well, um, I had my troubles with drugs. I've gotten caught out there. You know, I really was brought out on drugs for a little while. And um, it was kind of hard not to be influenced by it because it was there. Like nowadays, we don't, we didn't have that much awareness about drugs. Uh -huh. so it was just if you do it or you don't. Right. You know, nowadays there's so much opportunities for the youth to know about drug preventions and all these other things that are now affecting our society that I really am kind of saddened that we didn't have back then. A, minor, a lot of our people that who may have went on might have still been here if we had all these interventions that are right. for the youth now. Mm -hmm. That's a sad thing. You know, there's so much about HIV awareness that we didn't even know. We just got hit. You know, we, it wasn't a black 
thing at that time during the 80s we they're always considered it was like a white man's disease but we didn't know that it was already building it and it was going to take so many of our people and uh, we didn't have that um like you said the hiv awareness and all mm -hmm. these interventions and all these you know opportunities to know how to protect yourself at that time right so um, unfortunately a lot of our people got lost Right. And so with, with that, a lot of people, you know, dying and um, and suffering through all of that with that time, a lot of our history was sort of erased because it went with them. Right. And they didn't have a chance to pass it on. Right. A lot of the talent, all of that. Exactly. If we could have just maybe a, got a, a wake up call maybe like five years earlier than we set back, I think the majority of our people would have been saved. Right. And like I said, and a lot of our talent. Well, at that time, we didn't know nothing. We, we didn't yeah. know. We didn't think it was going to be us, you know. Mm -hmm. just, we just took it for granted. Oh, no, I, I, so, that's, that was the mentality back then. Exactly. We, know, what's that going to happen to any of us? With her, and that was it. <laughs> we didn't know what, like, baby, tell her what's going on. We didn't, right. They didn't tell us what was going on. Mm. You know, we didn't want to know what was going on. Put it like that. It was like, death, turn a deaf ear to it and just go on. Mm. Like I said, yeah, I think a lot of, if we had that much um, knowledge back then, a lot of things would have probably made the bowling scene a lot better nowadays. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but there are so many things wrong with the bowling scene now. Mm -hmm. But a lot of things that we could have probably enhanced the upcoming. Because like, when you take a whole block of generation away and then you just have... Um, you well, there was one, kids running the scene right. now. <laughs> you do, you Where our have, elders were gone. <laughs> right. We don't have, like, the parents, you know, to teach, you know. You, That's you true. Hear, you hear my dear say, well, how old is your mama? <laughs> say, well, how old is your grandmother? You know, like, well, baby, what? Oh, never mind. You hang on my phone, you know, because you're too young. <laughs> There's no way you can tell me what I need to know. Right. So, I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine. You're a busy man, I know. Okay. <laughs> It's just a mess. <laughs> They're trying to get me now. <laughs> they hear me say, shut up, Michael. The phone, the God, they're calling me. <laughs> but no, we really, um, we missed a lot. And a lot has missed in translation. Mm. And in terms of ballroom, like um, going back to you walking balls, I know when you hit a certain age and you're known for like beauty and, and glam and, <laughs> and all of those things in the ballroom scene. And, you know, we're men of a particular age right. and we're getting older. How, how do you deal with that? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I personally just shrug it off. You know, I uh -huh. know I, I know that I can still turn ahead. <laughs> as well, I mean, you're, you're a handsome scene, man, so... Uh, I believe I don't think it's it's not wasted just right. for the ball. Like, I wish I could have taken it further, mm -hmm. but um, I'm comfortable with. But I'm you know I'm, mm -hmm. I'm aging gracefully. Hopefully, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, no, you are. You're very so handsome. I can really say, but. <laughs> As far as the ballroom scene and the way they're judging, how they compare, there's always going to be someone that much that's coming up. During the time that I was walking, I kind of got frustrated seeing those, you know, older guys not, you know, still competing. You mm -hmm. know, you, I figured I'd stop and let some of these people behind me come mm -hmm. through because I know how hard it was for me to come through. That's why I took a break for a moment and you know, I was like, you know, well, okay, I've gotten acknowledged, I've gotten my tears, now I can just chill and do something else. You know, there are some people that's coming up behind me, Stuart and all of them and Iris and them. They were coming on Alan Adonis, they were coming up behind me. For me to still feel like I should walk and compete with them, mm -hmm and not acknowledging that these people are going to have a harder time and mind you there's still the older guys still walking before <laughs> me that still try to compete with them i'm like well can't when are y'all gonna sit down uh -huh. <laughs> you know? but i've always felt that it would be easier mm -hmm. you know if you just bow down i mean i've got my acknowledgement so. right well the scene is so young now right but it well, kind of always attracted a young it was it it well back then there were I told you, I came in the end, right at the end of the, the, the <laughs> last of the, the, I think I was one of the last babies adopted into anybody's house. Right. So I don't think the Ebony's came around right around I did, but they all were my age. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the, everybody else was much older in 
the scene at 8 in 1981, 1979, they were already walking three and four years prior. Well, so, 1979. Yeah, they were walking out there, the princess, <laughs> running around the air. Well, I know David's been walking ball since 1972. See what I'm saying? And that was the year I was born. <laughs> but mind you, I just... <laughs> I think I'm that's great, that's though. Right <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I think it's... Do you think that it's... What do you think of that, actually, when somebody is, um, you know, uh, older in the scene and they're still, you know, either participating or in some way connected to ballroom? Is You think that's okay? So, I, I think it's fine to be part, um, connected to ballroom. Uh-huh. No problem. Well, it's a mentor and stuff, right? I think, I think you, could, you could probably say, well, come on, these are my babies. Let me push them on through. I, yeah. see, this, I see this person. Mm -hmm. I get those acknowledgments. I've, I, myself... Walking to compete. I don't mm -hmm. know. Do you have children, like gay children, that you Only when push I out there? Ephraim, and <laughs> but the, the Ephraim had his own little crew. Oh, okay. Ephraim, you know, the police. That is my only child that <laughs> I brought into the scene. <laughs> and I think he he took over from when I got tired and said, well, damn, they, he kept the house relevant. Mm -hmm. Ephraim and his whole crew, from Chrissy and all of them, they made the house of Pui during their time frame that much more relevant because mm. like I said we lost in that time frame of 81, 82, 83, 84 oh, I could imagine got, like, white yeah and that's the sad and, uh, and a lot of I mean it's important to get that um, those stories because yeah. the kids today don't know right. what it's like to lose everybody you know and me though, like totally, literally totally totally and then after Ephraim his children were gone Right. Like, you know, nothing from the virus. Well, I get chills just drug. talking about and it. It's, it's, it's a sad thing. I think me, Ephraim, there are still maybe Michael, Michael, Michael Grant Dupree mm -hmm. and Curry Dupree. And there's like very few from the generation before me that are still here. But then there's not, there's so many that's gone. Mm -hmm. Even with the House of LaBeige, they transferred their houses. They they had children that were born and went to other houses, so they created their own from the House of LaBeige. That kind of went on. Their generation continued on their legacy. Mm -hmm. Even though they went to other houses, they were still considered from the House of LaBeige. Right. Like that. The Dupuis, we really did not chose to like found other houses or create we just kept the name and mm -hmm. it went with the grave you know but we're still here hey. <laughs> and in terms of um what you know the difference the comparisons of yesterday and today what do you think about the ongoing arguments and the fights i mean they've been going on for for a while now but they seem to get more intense i think it's a lot to do with the way the judging okay um this tin or chop really kind of disillusions me because I don't think anybody who would want to willingly walk should just be chopped unless mm -hmm. they're totally out of the category, just not. Oh, because it was fun. different back. Right, you would you would score it based on your what they thought. So like you, you get a nine, nine. Oh, you okay, yeah. a ten, and then you would have to explain why mm -hmm. you're giving this person a nine. You right. just didn't give them a oh, chop. And, and send them away. And send them away. You know, people are very disillusioned and people are, they get bitter. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I can see this ongoing thing, you know, they say, oh, we'll come back next time, just get them next time. You don't want to have to be on a, you know, competing on the floor and every time you turn around, just because someone on the panel chose not to give you your 10 and they may not like you or your house, they decide, well, let me just chop you. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not what it was about. It was about you get up there and compete. You're here for a special category, nostalgia. You get the best interpretation of what they're asking for. And right. if the judge does not think you deserve a 10, you then get a chop, like a total disregard for you. got maybe a 9 or an 8 well, because you wasn't giving me all of what mm -hmm. I was asking for the category. Right. Do you think and that, that should come people, back? And that'll get people coming back. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that that chop chop. I wish you could come back, but I guess with the way that the balls are progressing now, you're mm -hmm. gonna get through the next category as soon as you well, can. Well, I always thought that it was nice when people would get there's the first place, the second place, exactly. and the grand prize because it, it gave everybody like, oh, okay, you right. know, maybe next time I'll get right. right. I'll get first, <laughs> so that's right. I got first place over this person, but then now it's just like it's grand enough. That's right. Like, 
and but see, the and that started in the nineties, right? It's kind of started more in the nineties or I late eighties. The late eighties, early nineties, they got very less speedball. All right. Because <laughs> all of a sudden everybody was pressed for time. Yeah, right, baby. The ball, we gotta be out of here by certain time. And uh, back then, the ball started like around well, two or three, four o'clock in the morning, <laughs> but it went into the well into the afternoon. Damn. Back then, not <laughs> I would have been babies. cranky. Right. The venues are not giving, you know, come to a ball at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. No, baby, you come like 4 30. Four o'clock in the morning, right? And it was it was acceptable back then because venues were not pressing you out. The so door. that's probably why people in the scene still come late, even though they know the that the doors open at ten and the mm. ball could start at eleven. Right? They still forget. <laughs> it's in, it's, it's in engraved into our <laughs> DNA, right? You know, but that is interesting. Back. Venues are not having you there all night nowadays, right. especially not in New York City. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's getting fun.